Welcome to the Sunday special on Top Mid Talk. It's a potpourri of our favourite longer pieces, ideal for downloading and enjoying when you have a little bit more time. Top Mid Talk. So I'm Monty Mython, editor in chief of Top Mid Talk, and I'm joined by Professor Mike Grocott. Also, got with me two colleagues from Australia. But Paul, in your uh, lecture yesterday in the morning, we were reflecting on perioperative medicine and the shape of the development of, our, of anaesthesia in the world. You showed a slide of the International Perioperative Medicine Curriculum Group. Could you just expand on that a little bit and then we'll bring in our special guest? Uh, yeah, so I, mean, I think um, there's been a lot of talk by different anaesthesia groups around the world and uh, it's inevitable that perioperative medicine will play a large part of, of our specialty into the future. And um, I guess with my travels and some of the research I've been doing, uh, I was able to contact or be in contact with, with like-minded people who believe in and, and are working on uh, teaching or education in perioperative medicine. So the international group that um, is really uh, I guess a group of like-minded people at this point, still sort of semi-formal, um, but the aim is to develop an agreed curriculum of what perioperative medicine education and training should be uh, and that's really aligning the current you know different parts of the world where people are interested in it obviously here in the UK but equally in Australia New Zealand uh, also through Asia and probably Africa uh, and of course into the US and, and Canada and so on. And that, that group at the moment doesn't have any formal structure or governance structures or, or authority of any form as you say it's like-minded individuals who are just trying to ensure that the, whatever perioperative medicine grows into, it doesn't wander off in different directions. Exactly. It would be, be, be rather silly, really, if, we, if people have a different view of what, what it entails and how, it, you know, how and what should be taught. Uh, so we, I think, all believe that the first thing we should agree on is a, a curriculum of what perioperative medicine training should be. And I think once we... And we've, we've got to the point now where I think we, we've got an, an agreed curriculum... Uh, once we've got that, then the next um, series of decisions are around, well, how should that be overseen? Uh, is there a governance structure required? Um, what sort of content would be produced and who'd produce it? Uh, and if out- outside providers were, go- were wanting to um, provide a uh, teaching material that, I guess, reflected that curriculum, uh, would it require some sort of endorsement or otherwise? And it's those sort of more governance administrative components that we're moving into now. So, so from the Royal College of Anaesthetists perspective, Mike, um, we had our curriculum remodelled and um, work done by Chris Carey resulted in us having GMC approval in June 2016 uh, of what we're calling our perioperative medicine curriculum, if you do your FRCA. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. So I, I guess we uh, in the UK have taken a particular approach um, in that we took the view that the perioperative medicine curriculum was was already in large part, there were a few few additions and a few tweaks, but it was already in large part embedded in our anaesthesia training and that all anaesthetists, anaesthesiologists should be uh, competent in perioperative medicine. So, so in many ways what, what Chris did was move around and relabel elements that were already part of our training. Now, obviously there are different views internationally as to how that, that should be done. So, and uh, in parallel, there's been the development of a MOOC, a collaborative endeavour between, led by UCL, by Dr. David Walker and colleagues in particular, uh, which has been very, very popular. So that's a, some learning that's out there that's free at point of, uh, of access if you abide by the, the epochs that are laid down for the free access. Uh, and, uh, but the other major development was um, um, master's programs. And, the, and Dr. David Walker, again, from the UCL perspective, has led that as one of the masters that are available. And that's been very, very popular. And he's been working closely, Paul, with your institution and your your special guest you brought along. Would you like to introduce your David Walker? <laughs> uh, well, yes, I'd like to introduce Dr. Joel Simons, who actually has been or, or headed up, first of all, the development of our university-based um, master's program in perioperative medicine uh, and now is working with David Walker and, and others to try and um, develop potential collaborations and linkages so that there's a, 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 a sort of a shared qualification that could run across different universities or other educational institutions. So I, I might let Joel uh, talk about it further. So Joel, w- welcome back. Great to have you here again. So you, you. Be, you, you guys have led the way. I don't know if there was a, any uh, educational endeavour that predated the Masters in Monash or the, the, the early courses you did. 
Uh, tell us a bit more about that and then tell us where you think we're going in the future. Well, really, the first perioperative medicine curriculum was set up in 2009 when uh, Monash and the Alfred commenced the uh, perioperative medicine short course. Uh, that has evolved. Uh, we're now in our 10th year of our short course, um, roughly about 200 uh, participants annually worldwide. It's a totally online course with an optional day component. We commenced our master's program uh, 45 years ago, um, which was the first master's in perioperative medicine um, in the world, and uh, developed the curriculum uh, from from that. Uh, that master's program uh, is also um, now run totally online. We used to have direct contact days, but um, it's run totally online um, with uh, reading material, with uh, videos, um, with online collaborative uh, components as well. And that's really grown from strength to strength. What David Walker and I have realised um, over the last few years is that different institutions approach perioperative medicine from very different angles. Um, the angle that UCL has approached their perioperative masters is different uh, from that of Monash. And what we realise is that we actually really need a hybrid um, of uh, both of those uh, curricula to um, develop a, a true perioperative medicine curriculum. Excellent. And the, there's, there is a global audience, I think, for that. And there are, as you say, other master's programs that have been launched. And, you know, the ambition is to get the education as broad based as possible. Now, master's are, by some people's, in some people's view, uh, relatively expensive. They're, they're extremely high value for money, but not necessarily accessible to the whole world. If we're working in the Australian economy or the UK economy, which broadly speaking is similar to many of the economies you've referred to, that's not really going to open it up to the whole world. Is there any way that we can make the learning more accessible? I'm not sure we can change the economics of getting the degrees from our universities, but can we make the the knowledge base more accessible? Uh, yes, I definitely think we can. We, we need to develop uh, courses which um, are more economically accessible, uh, to the majority of the population and that could be done under a structure like an international board for perioperative medicine which would make um, not only make education accessible but would also ensure that uh, what is being taught in perioperative medicine uh, is similar throughout um, all regions of the world. Now one of the risks there is we label it in some way and it becomes an international diploma certificate whatever it is and then the suggestion is that somebody does a version of that in a relatively uncontrolled way and says they're now a qualified practitioner so how do we, how do we keep a lid on that we'd have to be very careful um with that and um pitch it more at an uh, at a level for um, education acquisition in perioperative medicine um D um, differently from what uh, Mike had uh, said with uh, what your college has done, um, the College of Anaesthetists uh, in Australia um, is actually of the view our training is two years shorter than yours and um, we didn't feel that our trainees um, had all the skills to be called perioperative medicine specialists. So what our college is doing is uh, having a two-tiered system where people who have their anaesthetic fellowship from our college will be called uh, perioperative practitioners and then there will be a two-year fellowship um, which is optional um, which can be done uh, to get uh, a perioperative me formal perioperative medicine fellowship and those people would be called perioperative medicine specialists. Okay, and uh, the, our college uh, is working on that at the moment and we should have a fellowship in the next four to five years. Fantastic. So, Mike, it, 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 the way you described what we have now of people who are going to get the FRCA, become a fellow of the Royal College of Anaesthetists, that, that, is, that is or isn't the plan? It, it, so it, it is the plan. And I, I mean, it, it, I'm not, but, but not, not, not extending <coughs> training, we think. We, uh, we don't think it will extend training. Because we're two but years longer already. There, there are folk that could do... Um, some people are already choosing to do perioperative medicine fellowships and therefore clearly mark themselves out as someone who's going to be leading a service and, and this will be a major part of their career. Um, but, um, and, and this isn't really an, an educationist comment, it's more you know, how the profession develops. We, we took the view, uh, and certainly I hold the view, that uh, if, you, if you start to divide people into those that do and those that don't, uh, the path feels like it leads to schism so in the same way as we've seen in critical care where you get a faculty and then the faculty 
develops a momentum of its own and, and naturally becomes an independent specialty and you're probably 20 years further down the road in Australia than we are in that regard in the UK um, that, that carries great risk for anaesthesia in my view as a profession and actually the alternative route is to say we're all anaesthetists and perioperative physicians uh, and, and in a way that guards against the, uh, the risk of what's coming which is you know, non-physician anaesthesia providers and technology which will eat up some of the technological role of anaesthetists but we, it sounds like we're going to end up in the same place, though, Mike. People who get their FRCA without extending their training will be perioperative practitioners. Correct. The people who decide to do a fellowship en route and do the advanced training will be the specialists, as Joel just described. Is that So we'll end up in the same place in that regard, but the people who don't do that in, in Australia uh, in 30 years' time may find themselves more professionally vulnerable than those that do. Did you see it that way, Paul? Oh, well, I, th- I think those concerns are real, and I think this is part of the conversation everybody should be having around the world, certainly an or anesthesiologist, because we need to get a better sense of where our future lies as a profession, and it probably lies in a range of directions. And I think there is room for that flexibility, um, but without it being in, in any way restrictive or damaging or creating, a, as you say, a schism in the, in the process... Um, I think the important part of it is for everybody to continue the conversation so that we're aware of where we're going, what are the risks and benefits of it, how can we justify certain decisions. And I think if we are engaged in the process, uh, we can obviously uh, help steer it in the right directions, uh, focusing around what's best for patient care and so on. Uh, And I think the future will be fine. Um, If, in fact... You know, after several years, we feel that there are some issues that are arising that we hadn't foreseen. Then I think we can always change course again. Uh, We can always make adjustments to what we're trying to achieve. I think what we have to be mindful of is that we've looked at all of this through a slightly different prism. Because I think, Paul, you referred to it yesterday. You did some other things in medicine before you took a side entrance into anaesthesia. Is that that right? At least least in part, yes. (laughs) And, And, Mike, I think you're what the Americans would call triple boarded is that right from the so I also did some other things um, both, so both medical and non-medical before getting and, into anesthesia yeah, no, and yeah. I did I did four or five years of general medical and specialist medical things so, so we, we actually had quite a lot of general medical training which makes us slightly lose sight of the fact that you might need those few extra years is it? and in the USA when I was working there if you did subspecialist anesthesia training it's a three year program that you know flashed flash to bang and does not include much of that general medical training so that is that's what you're addressing in your plans Joel is that right? Uh, correct um, the Australian and New Zealand College of Anaesthetists is of the view that um, we don't own perioperative medicine and yeah. we are modelling perioperative medicine on our faculty of pain medicine where the college is just really an umbrella body uh, for a whole lot of other um, professional organisations like the Uh, College of Physicians or the College of Surgeons so um, the aim of the College of Anaesthetists is to really oversee perioperative medicine uh, education and qualifications but people will be able to come into perioperative medicine from numerous uh, from numerous directions. So you're on course to have a new faculty? No we're not uh, developing a faculty at this stage just a a fellowship the um, the uh, College Council stopped short of developing a faculty at this moment in time but that might change in the future where do you think we are on that one mike so i think we're uh, our ambition is similar in that we uh, hope to be the home of perioperative medicine within medicine more broadly so if you were a surgeon or a primary care specialist and you wanted to do that you would come to us to the royal college of anaesthetists uh, to be credentialed and probably have associate membership but but our current view i think uh, certainly, my personal view is that we should that all anaesthetists should have that training as part of their core training. So you would become an anaesthetist and perioperative physician. Uh, o- over the horizon, because the discussion at the Royal College of Anaesthetists started before we got there, including discussions about a potential name change or at least a strapline change. Now, if the majority of departments around the world, like yours is Paul and, and ours is, and I don't know what yours is, Mike, ends up being called anaesthesia and perioperative medicine, does the college eventually follow that path? 
or the I, colleges follow that path, or is it irrelevant? Like you said yesterday about the London School of Economics. I, I, no, I think it is. It is relevant. I think it's important. I think if we don't, we risk uh, others choosing to declare that actually that that they are the home of perioperative medicine, and I think that would be a, a great shame for our specialty, and prob- probably the wrong thing to happen overall for medicine. Uh, I, th- I think the timing. I think there's a lot of support, certainly in the UK at the moment, from our surgical colleagues. I think they, they understand the need for this. Um, and the comment, the comment about London School of Economics was uh, you don't lose your core brand by adding additional brands. So okay. the London School of Economics is called, it's actually called the London School of Economics and Political Science, but we all know it as the LSE. So, and so, so the Royal College of Anesthetists and Perioperative Medicine might be what it's called in the future, but people don't st- stop calling it the Royal College of Anesthetists. And most of the time we call it the college. Or exactly, or the RCOA. Paul? Yeah, oh, yeah and I think also, of course, I, I, I would never stop calling myself an anesthetist. I'm very yeah. proud of our specialty. Yeah. Absolutely. I've always believed, really from day one, that the very best anesthetists or anesthesiologists uh, are, are, are good doctors, first of all. I mean, the technical skills and the application of anesthesia uh, for the surgical patient is crucially important, highly complex and requires a lot of training. Um, but equally, um, uh, we are also doctors in the more general sense and with that we need to integrate uh, patients' comorbidity and risk of complications and all the rest of it that goes into what we now think of as perioperative medicine is, I think, a, a key um, components of, uh, of a good anaesthetist. So I, I've been listening to what Mike's been saying around I guess the, the, the core training really of, of the specialty and how perioperative medicine is an essential large part of that. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. And I certainly don't think that will change. Yeah. Um, I think our specialty will incorporate a lot of perioperative medicine uh, as it has in the past and, and will in the future. But the core, right to the core of it, we're, as we keep discussing, we're not going to lose sight of the provision of world-class anaesthesia in the operating theatre operating room, right, mate? I completely agree. It's, it, it is the essential skill at the heart of, of our specialty. But I guess one, there is a distinction between being the individual who one-to-one technically provides that yes. and the individual who leads, manages and deals with the emergencies on that. And, and uh, my hunch is that the economics, the, the combination of non-physician providers and technology will push us in a direction whereby we're no longer one-to-one and therefore we reshape our self-image as an ethicist or an anesthesiologist. Right, Joel, last comments, because the, the noise is picking up behind us because we're getting ready to go back in for our second day at Anesthesia 2018. Uh, all I can say is uh, I think the future looks bright. Our college certainly includes large components of perioperative medicine in our training. Uh, the curriculum uh, was redeveloped a few years ago and is currently being redeveloped, so perioperative medicine is really taught from uh, the beginning of anaesthesia training uh, right up until fellowship uh, and will continue uh, to be taught uh, in that way uh, with um, extra qualifications uh, available uh, where required. But I think really the aim of, I see the aim of perioperative medicine in the future is to uh, be inclusive and not exclusive. And uh, if we put all of our heads together, I think uh, we can achieve the goal of improving patient care. Excellent. Thank you. And Paul, d- uh, very briefly, any, what we could, might we see next from the international group? Oh, I think the next step really is to uh, agree on a governance structure so that we can ensure that uh, the integrity of what the curriculum will be is, can be delivered or if the providers who uh, want to uh, come into this space, uh, it's done at a, at a standard that I think we all agree is suit and satisfactory. Um, and, and with that, of course, in consideration of how we would recognise that sort of training in different parts of the world. Brilliant. So, Paul, Joel, Mike, thank you very much indeed. We're uh, going to go back into the main meeting now, Anesthesia 2018, the international meeting of the Royal College of Anesthesia. Top Bed Talk. Nick Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. 
Finally, TopMed Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on TopMed Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.